Can you hear me? Can you hear me loud and clear? I'll just give a couple of minutes and then we can get started. I have uh, muted your mics, so feel free to chat uh, in the chat box. I'm just uh, going to give a couple of minutes and then we can get started. I hope my uh, audio is clear and all of you are able to see me. All right, so this is going to be a one hour session. Uh, please uh, hold on to your questions. Um, let me finish the presentation and then you can ask your questions. We can um, go over the questions one at a time after I have completed the presentation. The presentation is uh, available online under a CC license. So you can uh, freely share the presentation with colleagues and friends and whoever is interested in building a career with the free and open source software. Okay. So thanks uh, Ashok uh, for the introduction. I think we'll get started. Uh, there are not many slides in this presentation, but uh, I would like to spend a lot of time uh, interacting with you uh, and especially trying to answer your uh, questions. Okay. So please uh, hold on to your questions. Don't uh, type them in the chat box as yet. Once I finish the presentation, and then we go to the Q&A session, then you can ask your questions. So what I want you to do is just listen to what I'm trying to explain. And uh, if you have any questions, just note them down. And then during the Q&A session, we will take it up. Should that be fine? Shall we proceed to the presentation? Okay, let me share my screen. Can you all see the uh, presentation?
So welcome to this webinar on building careers with free labor and open source software. My name is Shakti Kanan. My website is uh, shaktiman.com. My online presence uh, goes by the name Shaktiman. Uh, you can reach out to me in my email address, which is author at shaktiman.com. I'm also available on IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Uh, my IRC nickname is mbuff. This presentation is available uh, under a CC license, so you can freely share it online and offline. So first question is, why should I be presenting this topic to you? So I have been a free software enthusiast for many decades, and I have written a book on how to get started with working on free and open source software projects. So you can actually click on this link to find out more about this book. There's also a presentation based on this book, which is freely available. I've been pretty active in the community uh, in, in terms of organizing talks, workshops, meetups, conferences, and also participating in events. So my gallery is available for reference. There are over 2,200 photos. So take your time in going through them at your leisurely pace. I've also been a volunteer in many user groups. Uh, the iLuxy is the Chennai chapter uh, where the user group meets on every second Saturday of every month in IIT Madras. Also been a mentor at uh, DG Plug, which is uh, Durgapur users group, which is mostly a online community. And my work has also been referenced and used by a lot of students who participate in uh, Summer of Code programs like the Google Summer of Code, uh, Mozilla, etc. Also been part of the uh, EFY family for many years. I've been writing articles for both um, Electronics for You magazine as well as OSFY. And hence they wanted me to present on this topic. Uh, my blog uh, feed is available here. I try to document as much of what I do. So you will find a lot of uh, blog posts going back to 2005. I've also been active in projects like Linux forums uh, as a moderator. I've been associated with the Fedora project, which is part of Red Hat, and also been contributing to GNU Emacs and other uh, projects in the community. And I hold an MS degree from RIT. So I've been active in this community for many years, and that's the reason why uh, I felt I should share my experience with you all today. So the way I'm going to address is try to answer this topic based on five W's and one H. By five W's, I mean why, uh, who, when, what, where, and how, okay? So let's begin with the why question. Why should you build a career in free and open source software? There are many objectives that people want to achieve, the many goals that people have, but what I have seen is the most important is recognition. When you contribute to a project, whether it is some documentation or whether it is a bug fix or whether it's some code patch, whatever it could be, it could be artwork. The most important thing is the people recognize you for what you have done. And that also comes from the open communication channels that these projects use. 
So we'll talk about that in the coming slides. You have a lot of feedback that goes in the community, in different social media, in mailing lists and forums, which greatly helps you in continuous learning. In our industry, it is very important that you keep yourself up to date with what is going on in the industry. And hence, it is important to update your skills and keep learning. Because when you stop learning, then you become a little outdated and then the job market may not be what you are looking for. So if you really want to grow in your career and you want to learn and progress, the tools, the technologies that are employed in the, the free and open source world is very prominent. And that is something that you should really, really try to learn and work towards. The other big advantage of working in this environment is diversity. You have the opportunity to work with people from different backgrounds, from different cultures, from different countries, in different time zones. So this collaborative effort, teamwork is something that you get to learn and it can greatly help you in your career. So this uh, image is a taken from the GNOME Planet website where it they have the hacker gochis which is nothing but the uh, photos of people who have contributed to the GNOME project. Right? Of course, when you work in this free and open source software, you do get recognized, uh, you become popular. Of course, there's, there's a lot of good uh, money involved in it. A lot of the companies do use these technologies, not just for cost cutting, but also because of the, the quality uh, that is being delivered. And of course, you also get to travel a lot, uh, meet customers. Uh, so all these perks are secondary, but the most important reason that I feel that people enjoy and like to work in this free and open source software is that they get recognized for the work that they do. And that is the most important criteria. In a way, it also boosts your morale because then you are more urged to do more things for the community. So who should participate? Now, there are initiatives where at a school level, students are exposed to community events. So this link uh, provides some useful documentation on that. A lot of college students in India do participate in Google Summer of Code and other Summer of Code programs. If your faculty were doing research, you will want to use the software or even management can use the same. We have seen that people in the industry use it a lot. There are uh, government projects who also like to use the software, not just for cost cutting, but also because of the quality and reliability of the software. Uh, Non-governmental organizations, we've done a lot of workshops for them in India. They also prefer to use that. And, or if you're just a hobbyist who want to just learn something new uh, and experiment, then you can try this. So there is no limit on who should be doing it. What is your background? Where are you from? All that doesn't matter. The only main thing that matters is your interest to learn. So this uh, picture is from the Science Hat Day that is uh, held every year in Belgaum. So here, um, 
we have students, school students, who do a lot of, who do a lot of science projects. You have people from the industry, uh, from government, they all come together and they do a lot of science projects, but at the same time, you will see most of them using uh, free and open source software. It is a nice event. Uh, it is uh, held in, um, in a resort. So if you get a chance, I would definitely um, encourage you to attend this, where you see collaboration happening between different age groups with different uh, people from varied backgrounds. And it's a fun event. When should you start working? You should start now. I mean, we don't have a time machine where you can go back and undo things. So time and tide, they don't wait. And hence, if you decide to do it, you should start right now. Do not wait uh, for the right moment. So what should you be doing if you want to build a career with Floss? The first thing is to use the software. It could be using some distribution uh, like Ubuntu or Fedora. You should be the first tester for the project. The important point with most first communities is they also have companies around these projects who want to look for people whom they want to hire. So if you can show that you are capable of working in these projects, that you have the skill set required to deliver the project artifacts, then those companies would be interested in hiring you. So what you should have, you should have a, an account in some version control site. It could be GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or any other where you can show the project members or the companies that you have contributed to these projects. It's also good to have a blog. It is important to have writing habits. So if you document whatever you're doing, um, it is useful not just for you, but also for others who are trying to learn from your experience. It's also important to be active in social media so you can connect with people who have like-minded interests. There are a number of communication channels that these projects use. Uh, Internet Relay Chat or IRC is very common. The other uh, web-based sites like uh, Gitter that are available. You should also try to attend a lot of conferences. So here are some examples. Uh, PyCon is for the Python programming language. We have RubyConf in India, GopherCon for Go, uh, FunctionalConf uh, for most uh, functional programming languages. Uh, Haskeek team, they run a bunch of conferences in India. There are also meetups, technical meetups that happen in a city or there are FOSS user groups that have regular meetings that you should try to attend. The important point here is when you are active in these user groups and you connect with people, you are basically connecting to a team member in a project or in a company who is using that project. So this gives them an opportunity to see what you can do. And then you can grow your connections this way and you'll be able to find jobs that you're happy to work with. So if you decide to work on a project that is of interest to you, so a project has many areas that need work. You could be working on doing documentation or you might want to translate the existing documentation into different languages if you're uh, 
writing and language skills are good. If you're very good in say, sales and marketing, you can work on being an ambassador for the project and trying to promote the project in different circles. If you're very good in design, you could be doing graphic design work uh, for the project. If you're more of a system administrator, then you could work on infrastructure specific tasks like maintaining the websites, uh, managing user accounts, uh, source control repositories, etc. And you can work on the websites of the project. Uh, internationalization is uh, adding support for the software to be able to show text in different languages. You can be working on news similar to marketing. If you like uh, software packaging, that is an option. Of course, if you are a developer, you could help in coding and testing as well. So contribution does not necessarily mean you're writing code. It could be any of these areas for a given project. So depending on your interest, you can pick something that will interest you in a given project and then you can start to pick up tasks on this project. So based on this areas of a given project that you choose, your role could be a web developer or you could be a, a writer or you could be a data scientist. So this defines your role and then the domain is actually your area of interest or specialization. Okay. So if I'm interested in say embedded systems, then I could be a systems engineer and then I could be working on a, a Rust based project or a C based project. So the mapping comes from your project that is of interest to you. Then you pick a area in the project that you're interested to work with. Accordingly, your job role and the area of expertise comes into picture. So where do you work on, on this project? Now, most projects, they will have some forums or mailing lists that you should subscribe to. And they will have specific IRC channels. So there is irc.freenode.net, there is irc.oftc.net, and there are specific channels that you should log into. And projects will have their own bug tracking system. Bugs are the best way to get started in working with the project. So some projects might use Bugzilla, some might use Mantis, BT, Track, Fossil, etc. So you should become familiar on using these tools. And the project will also have a roadmap. They will have specific timelines. Initially, people may not be willing to give you a a feature request or a major code change as a task. But using the bugs is something that will be easy for you to get started with. Of course, a project documentation will have a wiki site like MediaWiki or Moin Moin, etc. And of course, their source code in terms of code uh, websites, everything will be under revision control. So you should basically learn to use all of these tools that are associated with a project. So this is an example of XChat. So you have different channels here on free node and then your list of users. It's simple text based. Whenever you're online, try to uh, log into these um, project channels, uh, try to participate in the conversations, make friends basically, and they will be able to help you uh, both on the professional level. Also, if you need help uh, on jobs 
and other aspects they will be able to help you so the question of how do you go about actually working on this projects this is just a short quick list the first thing you should do is you have to use the software you are primarily a tester for the software okay you need to understand how the project tools are being used you have to join the specific communication channels it could be irc uh, mailing lists forums whatever the project uses okay read the project documentation they'll have user guides they'll have administrator guides they'll have developer guides so you use and test the software and then find a mentor in that project who can guide you as i mentioned earlier the best way is to start fixing bugs because you want to show to the team and the project that you are capable of working and hence you will be a contributor to the project and that's why bugs or fixing documentation is the easiest way to get in and then once you get familiar with all the tools and their workflows then you can slowly get into the major feature requests try to participate in team meetings uh, ask for feedback and peer reviews so all this when you do you are basically trying to connect to the actual project team members who are working on a day to day basis and when they are satisfied and convinced that you as an individual are able to contribute to the project then they will be interested in hiring you of course as i mentioned all the perks are secondary but the most important point is that they recognize you for your work the gitlab link here uh, is a operation lumen project that i started uh, more than a year back on trying to mentor students to get them to a discipline where they can contribute to projects there's a readme file available which you can uh, go through this is a screenshot of uh, bugzilla which is used by the k desktop environment project so some bugs will be marked as uh, beginners or newbies so try to pick those and try to allocate at least 1 hour every day to work on these projects so if you if you're consistently working on this then it will reflect on your progress now the most important point is having your source control a version control and the reason being is when you contribute a change the team member can actually see what is it that you have changed when was it changed and then based on that they can actually ask you questions as to why you made that change okay. so this is publicly available and this is your contribution and it's not going to change and that's the most important thing here to understand is that the communication is open and transparent your work is publicly available for people to view study and they will be able to tell that so and so person has done this change and hence they are capable of working in this project of course there's a lot more uh, that happens in terms of how you participate in the communication channels how is your documentation uh, how do you present yourself in talks etc but those you will learn in course of time so make sure you have a public account and all your changes go in public so in the free and open source software community there is competition but it is more of healthy competition the 
most important thing that you should focus is how you are progressing over a period of time. Let's say that today I decide to start working on these first projects and I want to see from a week from now as to how much I have progressed or a month from now or a year from now. If you have blogged and documented all the tasks that you have done and all your changes are available in the version control, then you can go back and see and analyze which projects you have worked on, how much you have spent time, etc. So the most important point is to see how you have progressed over time. And that is a very, very crucial assessment that you should make. So there's a lot of uh, references uh, for further reading here. The free as in freedom from Richard Stallman talks about the history of free software and how the whole movement began. And there is a culture to it. And you have to see if whether you fit into that culture. And that is very important. The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond also goes into two schools of thought. One is the Cathedral model where you do what your boss tells you. So there is no, not much of questioning happening. The free open source model is more of the bizarre model where there is a lot of communication and open discussion that happens. There is not much hierarchy and it's pretty much a flat organization. And that is the model that we use and they are two different cultures. So whether you fit into that culture is something you can try by uh, working on a FOSS project. Revolution OS is a good uh, movie. Um, it also talks about the history of the free software and open source movements. A good book by Paul Graham, uh, definitely worth reading it. And here I use the word hacker in its uh, right definition. Hackers are people who want to push technology to the forefront, who want to solve challenging problems. Unfortunately, in the uh, public mindset, they have a different definition. So in engineering today, hackers are people who want to hack on code, who want to uh, improve the, the tools and the technologies that we daily use. So this definition is given by Eric Raymond also in his article on how to become a hacker. So I would definitely recommend that you read these. The architecture of open source applications is also a uh, publicly available online book. Uh, Linux and the Unix philosophy by Mike is also good. Uh, all my presentations are available here and also recommend you to read my book. The careers is uh, presentation is an old presentation that I made uh, many years ago. But that's also available for uh, your reading. So this concludes the presentation, a brief one in terms of how you should approach working with free open source projects in order to get a career with that. So with this let me turn off the screen share and open it up for questions. Just scrolling through the chat log. So Jagmeet is asking, should one contribute in popular projects or how to find where one can invest time to go ahead? So popularity is subjective. So what I would suggest is you have to first use a project that you like and you enjoy working with it. And 
that's the project that you should want to contribute. So the first thing is you should use the software. You can test the software and use it on a daily basis. And then you go into contribution. So never do things because others are doing it. Always work on things because you enjoy and you like doing it. That's, that's a universal principle, not just for FOSS, but that's something that you should definitely apply. I'm scrolling up to see how can one manage this along with a regular job, which might be quite demanding. So what you need to check is if you decide to work on a free and open source project, you should check with your employer if it is okay for you to contribute because it should not be a conflict of interest. And whenever you uh, are employed, they would ask you to sign a non-disclosure agreement and there'll be some terms and conditions which might forbid you to work on these projects. Also, if you decide to work, the employer might claim copyright on that. So it is important that you choose the right organization who understand the FOSS culture, who want to encourage you to work and learn in this process. So it's up to you to decide on that. Generally, there are people who have regular jobs. They work on these FOSS projects during the nighttime or during weekends. So there is something that you have to decide how you want to go about it. It's a good question. Who are the end users, customers of the open source project. So not all projects are commercial. Some are designed because they are useful for their own personal needs. Uh, some are hobby projects. So they decide to write it because they find it useful. So it could be yourself who is the end user for the project, or it could be uh, a specific community of users, or it could be companies, or it could be government organizations. So there is no specific uh, user base. It all depends on the scope of the project. Like if you take the Linux kernel, for example, it is used in Android systems, it is also used in servers also in desktops. So it depends on the scope of the project and who's involved in it. How to get into one project? As I said, I would recommend that you use uh, some free and open source software distribution. First use it and see what software is available. Try to find something that you're working on a daily basis and then try to find a software that helps you to solve a particular problem. It could be making presentations or you want to use spreadsheets or it could be image editing, whatever it is, right? So you first use the software and then see how you can improve upon it. The most important point is you should like and enjoy using the software. So then you will more and more start testing it. And then there are more feature requests coming in, then you'll want to contribute to it. Can you list out what are the tools minimum to contribute to open source projects? So every project has their own set of tools that they have chosen. Uh, most of them will fall into these broad categories of, as I mentioned, uh, a mailing list or forum to discuss things, uh, both from a user-based perspective and from a developer-based perspective. There will be a 
instant messaging like IRC, for example. There'll be a bug tracking tool. There'll be a project management roadmap tool that I've mentioned. So these are some common categories that are that are available and most of the tools that they use will also be uh, free and open source. So you have to become familiar in using these tools. So there is a learning curve in that. So it might take some time for you to get used to it, but you have to be very patient when you are using these tools and working with these projects. Uh, GitHub being taken over by Microsoft and Microsoft itself opening up to open source. What are your views? Um, I mean, these these are very subjective. Um, I, I know that Microsoft today is uh, funding a lot of, uh, I think, Python, C Python specific work it is sponsoring a lot of the Python development work. So, I mean, it depends on, it varies from individual to individual. So, and each, this is more subjective and different people will have different opinions. But yes, uh, today, if you talk about DevSecOps or you're talking about data scientists, a lot of the tools that they use are free and open source. And it's very, very important that to try to learn a lot of these tools and become yourself skilled so that you can actually be active in working on these projects. And that's a potential hire as well. How to ensure we are not working on an issue bug which are being worked by someone else? That's a good question. So the way you would start is you would write to the mailing list of the project or the forum and say, uh, hello, I am so-and-so. I am interested in contributing to this project. And uh, I see these are some bugs that I might be able to work on. Can you please let me know if anybody else has already worked on it? Uh, is there any uh, past history of discussions that I need to be aware of? Uh, is there some mentor who can guide me in this? So you, you have to first write to the team and then ask them, and then they will be able to tell you, uh, don't work on that bug, it's already been tried, and or they might suggest other, other bugs that you might want to work with. So that communication between you and the team is very, very important. That's a good question. Uh, please differentiate between free and open source. So the briefly, the free software movement, they, they want everything to be free. They generally don't um, like any kind of binaries in their system. The open source community, they, they don't mind having both proprietary and open source on the same system. Uh, and that's just a brief differentiation, but there are more differences. I would definitely recommend uh, reading Richard Stallman's book um, and also the other open source references that I have given. The Revolution OS movie is also pretty good. Uh, you should uh, be able to get some insights onto that. So for example, in, in free software, we want even the BIOS to be freed. We don't want that to be proprietary. We want open hardware. Everything from the hardware designs till the applications, the code or the design should be available under a liberal license. Open source is not like that. They don't mind having a proprietary hardware, uh, proprietary binary firmware that you can load for wireless chipsets to work uh, with some open source software. So that's a, that's a prime difference. 
solving problems with code in hacker world or hacker websites also come under first contributions um, so when you submit the code you might want to check uh, what license they opt by default most of the uh, free and open source software licenses like gpl or mit and apache the they're pretty common so the question really is whether you're a student or you're a professional if you're a professional and you're writing code to these sites you might want to check with your employer but again it depends on who is going to use that code uh, are you solving the problems for uh, yourself as a challenge uh, just to see how best you can uh, crack those problems or you're going to share it with somebody then you need to put a license there are of course uh, coding competitions but again you need to check with the organizers as to what license they opt any project need a skill of programming language being an electronic engineer working as a telecommunication operations engineer experience will be difficult to choose which language to start with and choosing a project and so i need to use devops tools many deviation confusion mind to start so the most important thing in, in working in a project is make sure you understand the domain. So it, it doesn't really matter what your background is. You might be a specialist in electronics, which is fine. But if a project requires you to learn a programming language, then you should take the time to learn it. It's not just for programming language, but also for tools, also for communication channels. Right? So you have to be very patient because it's just like learning a bicycle. Nobody you know, has learned to ride it without getting injured or falling down. Right? So it takes time. So you need to give yourself some time to go through these requirements patiently. Write down what are the things that are required and then you work on it one by one. It's a simple uh, divide and conquer approach. So to me, background is not that much important. I mean, there are non-CS, non-IT people who are also doing very well in the industry because as I mentioned, the most important thing is whether you have the interest, the, the attitude to learn, and then you go about finding the right resources, the finding the right people to connect to, and then doing the actual work. So to me, degree uh, background is, 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 is really doesn't matter. Moving along. Uh, if you want to contribute to open source, where to store, is there a catalog site for that? There is no catalog site for that. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, first use the distributions, the distros um, on a daily basis. Try to use it for your work, for your daily home or work needs. And then pick something that you like. And I've already mentioned the different uh, project areas that you can decide from depending on your uh, skills and your interest. You can then pick it up uh, from there. If vendors open their hardware and capabilities, how do they earn a profit to invest in R&D and make the product better? So there are different business models in, um, in free and uh, open source software and hardware. Uh, of course, the open hardware movement is recent and uh, they're still experimenting. Uh, the Arduino project, for example, is quite popular. They have their hardware designs uh, available. So you basically pay for the manufacturing cost. 
A lot of people, they don't necessarily have the time to do their own designs. So they will just buy the product or they will want to require some consultancy being done for the product based on the hardware design. So consultancy support any future development. Uh, all this is additional means by which a, a company can earn money. Right. So there are different business models that you need to see and work out what best suits you. The advantage of using an open hardware like open source software is that a lot of people are actually looking into the design and they might suggest recommendations. They might be able to be able to tell you how to fix things if there's a problem. And more eyes looking into it is, is very good because you have people from different experiences uh, looking into the project. And that's the reason why today uh, free and open source software is very, very popular uh, in the industry because it's, it's, the quality is pretty good. And even if there's a bug, people will be able to give you a fix for it. And, and that's the most important point, right? The more people, with the, the bazaar model, a very flat structure, they will be able to discuss and come to a solution. Uh, I'm working as an assistant professor in engineering college where my students can get projects for the internship. So a number of uh, projects do sponsor interns. Um, I think you should probably approach uh, organizations like uh, Mozilla or KDE and maybe even have a memorandum of understanding where they can give you some of their time to mentor the students and students can actually spend some time with the projects. But the important point here is students should have the facility, uh, basic internet access, uh, a good system to work with, uh, be able to push their changes to the uh, project repository and so on. Also have, have them, you know, give them some time to actually work on these things. So there has been a lot of collaboration between these projects and colleges uh, in different countries. So you should definitely approach uh, these projects. A lot of them uh, have good funding as well. So it's not like they will necessarily do it for free. But even if not for the money, I think at least the students, if they work on these projects, it will definitely uh, will give them an experience like actually working in a real uh, company or project. So I would say you should definitely do it because your students are getting the experience and that will be an, a, an edge over the others. And people can actually see what they are doing. What are your recommend websites or app for technical articles, reads? It's a very generic question. I think it depends on which area of interest and domain that you're working with. I, mean, I would just use a search engine and find out uh, for your area of interest. What are the most uh, popular open source software and hardware on which you should invest money and resources to earn money? Well, it's a very generic question. Um, I mean, where you want to invest is up to you and you can, of course, uh, earn by selling hardware, maybe services uh, based on for software, but then you have to study the market. You see where your customers are, uh, what do they need? Does your solution actually solve their problem? And that's the most important thing, right? With the, your software actually meets the user's requirements, whether your services are uh, satisfying to the customer and only then they will be willing to pay. So you can do customizations on existing FOSS software. You can still release the source code as well. And so that's, that's up to uh, 
uh, how well you do your uh, market study and understand your customers good questions by the way a lot of uh, material available online i mean just use a search engine you should be able to find them in open source there are multiple tools say for example in devops of ansible chef and puppet and each and every mnc uses different tools for continuous integration is it possible to learn one and manage the others so every tool is designed for a purpose and every tool has a history and it is very important that you read that history why was this tool designed the way it was designed right so if you take ansible it, it basically was designed for a a masterless system you directly can push your changes to remote machines chef and puppet they have a client server architecture but later on of course you can do masterless setup with chef as well so each one is designed for a purpose and if a project uses a specific tool then you should take the effort to learn to use the tool and use it the way the project uses it because over the over time they have come to some workflow with these tools that they prefer so you cannot straight away go and say no don't use chef use ansible they will say no and you initially you want to prove your caliber with them you want to improve your credibility to the project so blending yourself with the project with their tools their workflows their processes is something that you should learn to do and also learning another tool actually helps you updating your resume as well so now you have two tools or three tools that you know which you can apply on different projects so which actually improves your resume and skill set but again not all tools are the same make sure you understand the difference you should know when to use it and how to use it and that's where companies are really interested in hiring people any other questions I think we're almost uh, nearing the one hour mark All right, so thanks for your uh, time. I know it's a Saturday afternoon. Um, you've been very uh, patient and attentive. Uh, please do go through the uh, presentation again and read through all those references that I have uh, mentioned. And I wish you good luck in whatever first project that you decide to choose to work with. I've also given my uh, contact information for your uh, reference. So feel free to reach out to me. And um, I also appreciate any feedback on this session. And uh, if you need any specific sessions in future, I'll be uh, happy to work with the EFI and uh, have more webinars like these in uh, future as well. So with that, let's uh, end the session. Um, enjoy your evening and the rest of the weekend. I look forward to seeing you all again in uh, future webinars. Okay. Take care and bye-bye.